we are going to dive into it. And today, uh, we're talking about what is church. What is church? Now, I had a conversation with someone recently, and they're like, oh, I know what church is. And it turned out they kind of knew what church was, but um, there was some little missing factors in there. As you know, we're going through a series right now where we're just going over the basic doctrines, the basic teachings, our basic teachings. What is it that we believed? Uh, believe, actually, we talked about God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, about the triune God. We talked about the fact that uh, we worship uh, a triune God, and, and we took time to discuss who God the Father is. We took time to discuss who God the Son is so that we have a clear understanding because how many of you know sometimes you think you know something, but you may not really know it? Have you ever looked up a word in a dictionary only to find out that the word meant something different than you've been using it as, right? So sometimes we think we know who God is. Sometimes we think we know who Jesus the Son is and who the Holy Spirit is. Um, and sometimes we even think we know what church is. Uh, but sometimes it's good to go back and just uh, make sure we know. And this is really what this series has been about. But when you think about church, many people, of course, think about a building. They think about, you know, I'm going to church is the way we talk about it oftentimes. We talk about I'm going to a building. Now, those of us that are a little wiser than that, maybe a little more understanding, have a little more wisdom, maybe a little more studied than that, then we recognize that church is not just a building. Yes, there is a church building. But what makes this building a church is not the structure, it's not even the steeple or the cross. That's not what makes this building a church. What makes this building a church is you and me. The church is always the gathering of believers, the gathering of believers. But before we dive into what the church, the universal church is, the global church, if you will, I want to talk to you a little bit, just a little bit, about our church, New Walk Church. This is part of my message, yes, our church, because I think you need to know a little bit about our church. Well, first of all, I want you to know that our church, New Walk Church, started about 10 years ago this October 9th, 2021. Back October 9th, 2011, New Walk Church met for the very first time. For the very first time, we met at uh, Knights of Columbus in Dunellen. Uh, we rented that facility, and it was a whopping 11 people there. We had a packed house that day. And most of them were young people, actually, college-age students that were there with us. And uh, we started with 11 people. October 9th, 2011. That'll be on a quiz somewhere, uh, so make sure you jot that down. Uh, we started with those people. From there, we started to grow, and uh, we decided to move to the Elks Lodge in Middlesex, New Jersey. And in Middlesex, New Jersey, by the grace of God, we were growing there and seeing more people being added to the number. And we started looking for another place to rent a facility, just something. And my wife always told me, why don't we rent a church building so that it looks like a church? Um, just so that you know, when we met at the Elks Lodge, the Elks Lodge had two bars and a disco ball. And uh, we, were, we prided ourselves as being the only church in town with two bars and a disco ball, all right? You'd never been to a church with two bars and a disco ball. But that's where we met. We were looking for a place to rent. Uh, we lived close to this facility here, and we thought, wow, what a beautiful location. What a great place for a church. And we were thinking, should we ask? But we thought, well, we don't know, like, anyone there. Uh, one day, just driving around, 
we happened to see the cleaning lady that was here at the time. We saw that there was a car parked outside, and we came, knocked on the door, and uh, asked, you know, is there a possibility for rent? So she's like, I don't know, but I know who I can put you in contact with. At the time, she put us in contact with Chris and Kaleski here, and uh, we spoke. She told us, listen, actually, our church is in a transition right now, and we're not looking to rent, but we may be interested in a merger. And uh, in that conversation, I thought, uh, a merger? Yeah, absolutely, let's do this. Well, long story short, uh, bada bing, bada bang, right? Like we started talking, and here we are today. Now, even before New Walk Church, there was Pilgrim Covenant Church that was already here, and they were going through a transition, but, and they were here for many, many more years before we came, but about 10 years ago, New Walk started, and now we're here today. So that's a little bit about our church. And, and what I want you to know mostly about our church, not so much our history, although that's a good thing to know, but I want you to know our purpose and our mission. Like, what is our mission statement? What is it that we do? What is it that we're trying to accomplish I'm gonna tell you what we're trying to accomplish we're trying to bring Jesus to people that's the very first thing we're trying to do we're trying to bring Jesus to people in every interaction with other people people should see Jesus living in our lives so we're trying to bring Jesus into this community frankly into all of New Jersey and beyond that we're trying to bring Jesus to people we bring Jesus to people and we want to bring people to Jesus. That's our mission. That's exactly what we want to do. You may want to jot that down. That'll be on a quiz somewhere one day too. So we bring Jesus to people and we bring people to Jesus. That's a little bit about our church, our local community, where you're sitting today. This is who we are as New Walk Church. But we are a local church. There is something that is called the universal church. Uh, we are the local church, but guess what? We're not the only Christians in this world. There are other churches that are doing a great work for the Lord as well, and they are also meeting probably right now in their churches, also studying the Word of God, also learning what the Bible has to say. And we believe that we are part of the universal church, the body of believers, people that have all been called out, people that are serving Jesus, that have put their trust in Jesus for salvation. So good news, we're not the only Christians in the world. That's the good news. Amen? We're not the only ones. And you should know that there's a whole world out there. And if, uh, I mean, we've got stuff like radio stations, we've got stuff like TV channels, uh, there's a whole lot. And if you don't know, I'd love to introduce you to some of that as well, because we are part of a much greater body. However, today, I want to spend the rest of our time discussing the church and three things in particular about the church. The first thing I want to discuss is how the church started. Like, how did this whole thing start? Was it the government that decided to set up a community of people uh, so that they can control those people? Like, how did this start? Was there a dude one day that thought, hey, you know what? Maybe I can bore people for about an hour every Sunday morning. Uh, they could come sit and listen to me talk, and I'll bore them half to tears, and they'll want to do this every single Sunday. How did the church start? Where did we even get this idea of being a church? By the way, did you know that atheists uh, today also have atheist churches? Yeah, that's right. They have their atheist communities that meet together for atheist worship. It is frankly hilarious. It's really interesting. But atheists have their own communities where they gather together now. We want to discuss why church matters. Why does it even matter that, that you're here? Why does it even matter that you join a church? Why does that even matter? Wouldn't it be better on a Sunday morning to sleep in, to wake up a little later, to have a lazy Sunday? Some people may be watching online says, yes, that's exactly why I'm watching online. Wouldn't it be better, right? I, I mean, really, did you really want to come and just sit down and listen to somebody talk for about 30, 40 minutes? Uh, why does it even matter that we do this? And the third question is this. 
what type of church should you join? Now, some of you that are here or maybe some of you watching, you're thinking, okay, I'm not part of New Walk. Uh, should I join a church? And if I join a church, what type of church should I join? And maybe when we're done talking about that, uh, you might even consider what church should I leave? Hopefully no one leaves here, but uh, you might want to say, maybe I'm in the wrong church. Or maybe you're here saying, I don't think our church adds up to what I think uh, a church should be. So let's discuss these three topics. The first one is this, how did the church start? Let's go there. Well, the church started 50 days after um, Jesus' ascension to heaven. I'm sorry, after the Passover, not, not the ascension, after the Passover. Uh, the day that we call the day of Pentecost. And I want to read what this looked like, the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost is in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. This is exactly how the church started. And this is important to know. Why is this important to know? It's important to know because it will let us know whether we have fallen off the rails or whether we're still right there. Are we still on track with what the church is and was always meant to be, or are we, have we missed it somehow? This is where the church started, first day of the church. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Who is they? Who is they that were together? These were the disciples, people that had been following Jesus around. After Jesus ascended back to heaven, the disciples were left alone, but they were together. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So let me just bring that so that you understand it. A bunch of Christians, about 120 of them, were sitting together, praying, seeking God's face. Suddenly a wind, a mighty rushing wind, comes into the room Tongues of fire uh, are above their heads. They're seeing like these tongues, these flaming tongues. And what happens? Suddenly they begin to speak in other tongues. Now, I don't want you to take it too far. What they were speaking mainly was different languages. Languages that they had not learned as children. Languages that they never went to school to learn. Languages that they didn't even know how they were speaking those languages, but suddenly they're speaking all these different languages. Now, there was a, a purpose for this, but let, let's go a little further, and then we'll discuss that. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. So what's happening is because of the feast of Pentecost, there were Jews from all over the place, Jews that spoke different languages, and they were coming uh, into Jerusalem. They were there. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one of them heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, wait, aren't these those who are speaking Galileans. So to them, it's a little different. It, it would be like you walking into a room and suddenly hearing a bunch of Spanish people maybe speaking Italian. Like you would say, wait, how are they speaking Italian? All these Spanish people, aren't they, they, they said, aren't they Galileans? They shouldn't be speaking this language. This is not native to them. Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language. They're like, this is not right. Like, like, this is not right. These people should not be speaking like this. Now, I put three dots there because there's a bunch of different uh, nationalities presented there. And I thought for brevity's sake, let's just skip that. But you are welcome to go read it, uh, Acts chapter 2. And this is ultimately what they're hearing. This is important. 
especially for us Pentecostals. This is important for us to hear. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. What were they saying? That is important. What were they speaking? The language matters, but is not as important as what they were saying in that language. What were they saying in that language? The Bible says that they were declaring the wonders of God. Declaring the wonders of God. You know what they were doing? They were praising God. They were praising God. And everyone around heard them declaring the praises of God. And they heard it in their own tongue and in their own language. This is the very first day of the church. The very first day. What is happening People are praising God in multiple languages. See, I believe that's what heaven is going to be like. Uh, Multiple ethnicities, multiple languages, multiple tribes, multiple tongues worshiping God together. So they're understanding them. Uh, Some theologians believe, and I agree with them, that this was in some ways a reversal of what happened at the Tower of Babel. Remember the Tower of of Babel, where the Tower of Babel, what happened was that because man was trying to exert himself and was trying to make himself greater with the Tower of Babel, what did God do? God confused the tongues. But here in the book of Acts, we see that God is not confusing tongues. He's bringing things back into order. He's saying, no, you're going to declare my goodness. You're going to declare my wonders in every tongue we read a little later on what happened then because everybody's confused peter stands up and peter's ready to preach and peter he preaches a, a lengthy sermon i'm gonna bypass that sermon again you can go back and read it but i'm gonna tell you his concluding statements in his sermon this is what he says therefore let all israel be assured of this God has made this man, Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. So Peter, remember Peter, wimpy Peter, uh, the one that denied Christ three times? All of a sudden now he's bold because he gets this empowerment from the Holy Spirit. Now he stands up in all boldness, and this is what he tells them. He says, you know what this is all about? This is the infilling of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and you know what this is in response to? This all comes because of our relationship with Jesus. This comes from Jesus. This is all about Jesus. He says, watch, watch. He says, this Jesus, and then he says, whom you crucified. That's not a very friendly sermon, is it? They're like, "Eh, Peter, tell us, what, what is this whole thing about? He says, remember Jesus who you killed? Remember Jesus that that you uh, put on a cross and crucified? This is all about that Jesus. Do you think they were convicted at all? Like, uh, us? Like, oh, we messed up. That was a mistake. He says, it's that Jesus. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. They were cut to the heart. They felt a heavy amount of conviction just strong conviction have you ever been there where you felt strong conviction like like i'm talking like really bad conviction i've told you already that in the past i have uh hurt my own feelings as i've been praying sometimes really confessing to god uh sins inside of me and i've hurt my own feelings in the past i picked up a book uh from david platt uh some time ago the book is called Radical. It talks about radical Christianity, and it's probably not what you're thinking about. But I opened up that book, and in the first few pages, I was so convicted that I had to close the book. Because I knew that what he was saying was so true. But it was, it was so true that it was as if I was in a dark room, and somebody all of a sudden turned on really bright lights. And I couldn't take it. And you might say, well, were you a Christian then? Yes, I was a Christian. Were you a pastor then? 
yes, I was a pastor then. And I just couldn't take the conviction, and I closed the book. Now, I got back to the book eventually. But sometimes it is important that we get cut to the heart. It is important that we have that conviction. And, and uh, he, they are cut to the heart. And, and Peter says, he says, brothers, what shall we do? They ask Peter. Peter replies, you know what you do? Now that you feel that conviction, he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. He says, repent and be baptized. He, this is the beauty about God, that even though he can convict us, he also gives us a way to deal with that conviction. That, that there's a way out. That it's not like he says, you're awful, terrible people, period. No. He says, look, maybe you are awful and maybe you are terrible. But let me tell you, it's very easy. All you have to do is repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. And he says, you'll be saved and you'll receive the gift of the promised Holy Spirit. Later on, and I, I don't have time to go over all of it, uh, that same day, the Bible says that about 3,000 of them committed their lives to Jesus, committed their lives to Jesus. That is when the church started. 3,000 people that day, along with the disciples. And by the way, just so you know, um, I don't think the Bible is like pastors, uh, pastors, we have a sin that we commit often. Many pastors do this. It's a little bitty sin. I don't think it's a huge sin, but it is a little bitty one in my opinion. And this is the sin. When one pastor asks another pastor how many people attend your church, pastors, we tend to round up. If we have 50, it's 100. But the Bible doesn't do that. The Bible tends to be very conservative, the Bible, when Jesus fed 5,000, the Bible doesn't tell us how many women and children were there. The Bible only says 5,000, which means that there were probably more people that received and took part of this miracle. Right here, the Bible says about 3,000. It's my personal opinion that it wasn't under 3,000. It was probably more than 3,000, but the Bible is just being conservative and said about 3,000. I think they rounded it down. But that's how the church started, right there, the day of Pentecost. That was day one. Now, Peter, in Matthew chapter 16, uh, Jesus asked him a very important question. He's asking the disciples, who do people say that I am? Peter gets up. He says, uh, he replies, who do people say that, I, that the son of man is? Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah one of the prophets but then jesus says but who do you say i am and peter answers this he says you are the messiah the son of the living god you're the messiah the son of the living god jesus responds to him and tells him peter no one showed you this this was god himself that has revealed this to you and he says i want you to know something on that rock i will build my church on that rock, what's the rock? Some people say that it's Peter. I don't believe that it's Peter. I believe it's on the foundation of Jesus Christ. On the fact that Jesus said, Jesus, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. You know what Jesus says? He says, on that foundation, on Jesus as the bedrock, as the foundation of our lives. He is the founder of the church. The church is here because of Jesus. It says, this, it says elsewhere in, in, in the Bible that Jesus is the cornerstone, the most important stone. Why are we a church? Because we're standing on Jesus. He is our foundation. So you should know. First of all, the church started on the day of Pentecost. That's good to know. Uh, it started as an evangelistic movement. You see that people are saved that day. And it all has to do with Jesus. Jesus is the foundation, the bedrock of it all. But you ask, why is the church important? Why does this matter? Why does it matter that I come to church? 
Why is this important? I'm going to give you a few reasons. Number one, it's important because the church is, first and foremost, a learning community. We come here together to learn, to learn. Uh, If we go back to Acts, look at the very first thing that the Bible says. After these people were saved, this is what it says. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. By the way, the Bible says that they met on a daily basis. On a daily basis to learn more about Jesus. To learn more about God. Every single day. Maybe that's one of the places where we've lost it a little bit. Because today, many Christians struggle just to make it one day out of the week. Imagine if we met every day. Every day. And now, I'm not suggesting that we start services every single day because there are obviously other ways to connect and to be together. Uh, But the reality is that the early church was on this every single day. Every single day, learning more about Jesus. Learning more about God. Here's my question to you today. Is your learning limited to these 30 minutes that we share together? Is your learning about God limited to these 30, 40 minutes, sometimes a little longer? But is it limited to this? Because if it's limited to this, there could be a problem, especially in the day and age where we live where you literally have uh, the Bible, you literally have resources that, that the early church never would have even conceived in their minds uh, the kind of knowledge that we have available to us today. I think at the very least, we should be learning. We should be devoted to the Word of God. They were devoted, devoted. What does that mean, devoted? It means that they kept on keeping on. They persisted. They didn't just quit when it got difficult, when it was a little too hard to understand, but they were persistent. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, it says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers, what? To equip people for works of service. What is a pastor's job? What is a preacher's job? Uh, My job is to equip you for service. It's not for me to do the service. I'm not saying that I can't uh, stand right there alongside of you, but it's not. My job is to equip you, to train you. And here's why. You have access to places that I don't have. You can go into places that I cannot go to. I cannot stroll into your office. I can't just come in and go to the back room of the store where you work. I can't come in there and and lead a Bible study out of anywhere. Uh, Like, I, I can't do those things. But guess what? You can. You can be a light there. I can't be a light there, but you can. Now, imagine if everything that I preached, you took note of, and you went and you took it to the places where you have influence. And you took it into your workplace. And you took it into your office. And you took it into the stock room at the store where you work. Would you imagine how people would be flocking, not just to church, but flocking to a relationship with Jesus Christ? You have relatives that I will never meet, that I will never get to talk to, but you can talk to. And it's my job to train you so that you do the work of ministry. I can go further there. Not only is the church a learning community, the church is also a supporting community. A supporting community. Look at, look at what the Bible says in Acts chapter uh, 4. Did I lose it here? There we go. Here we go. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. It says, All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that all uh, that that were there 
there was no needy person among them. There was, watch this, and, and please, please hear me here. There was a voluntary socialism that happened. And I say voluntary, I don't believe that socialism is something that should be imposed upon people. I believe that we should have the opportunity to, to share as we'd like to share. But the church, what did they do? They shared voluntarily. They were supporting one another. They were there. People were selling property, the Bible tells us. They were there. They were a supporting community. I had someone once uh, talk to me about how terrible churches are and uh, how bad they are and how they're money hungry and blah, 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 and all the stuff that you've ever heard about churches. And uh, I, I sat there listening to this man, and when he was done, I said, listen, I'm sorry about the experience that you've had at churches. I'm sorry that you feel like people have manipulated you and have taken your money and, and uh, all the things that you think that are wrong with the church. I am sorry for that. And I said, but, you know, I haven't had that experience. I said, if anything, my church has been a sheltering community. They've been there when I've needed them. When I was hurting, they were there. When I needed, they were there. The, the reality of New Walk Church is that uh, we need to be there for one another. And, and this is why even the connection, even the making sure that you're on an email list, making sure that you're part of our groups where we meet not just here, but we meet online and we do other things. Being part of those communities matter because this is how we stay in touch with one another. This is how we stay connected to one another. Some of us, geographically, we don't live close to one another. So the best way sometimes is through technology, is through a text message, is through a phone call. Uh, it is maybe sometimes through Zoom and a prayer meeting right there. But what's important is that we stay connected to one another, that we're constantly supporting one another. Church, don't let the lights fool you. Church is not a show. We don't come to church so that we can be entertained. Listen, there's nothing wrong with the lights. Obviously, I like lights. Nothing wrong with that. But when that replaces community, then we're in trouble. Because community matters. Being part of the church matters. Not just coming here on a Sunday morning, but being part of the fellowship. This is what was going on in the church. And I, I want to go just a little fa faster here. One of my favorite texts in the Bible is this. Oh, there we go. Galatians 6, verse 10. One of my favorite texts in Scripture. Look at what, what, the, what the church was doing. Therefore, this is what, what they're taught. Paul is teaching the Galatians. He says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. I challenge you for a moment. I challenge you. And, and, and not that there's anything wrong with outreaching into the community. There's nothing wrong with that. That's important. We need to call people. We need to make relationships with people. We need to bring them to Christ. Like we said, we want to bring Jesus to people and people to Jesus. Like that's what we want to do. There's nothing wrong with major outreaches. But I challenge you to, in the Bible, to find me a place where the church got together for an outreach that resembles something like food distribution or an outreach that resembles a backpack drive or something that says, oh, the people, the, the church was serving in the community. I'm not saying that it's wrong to serve in the community. I'm not saying that our church does it. I believe we should do it. But I challenge us for a moment, for a moment, to find in Scripture where the Bible says that the mission of the church is to serve the community. You won't find it. You will not find it. The, bo the most you can probably come up with is the Good Samaritan story. But the Good Samaritan story is not the church as a community. It's one person. Should you be a Good Samaritan? Absolutely. Should you serve people independently of the church as a body? Absolutely. But the church isn't out serving the community. Look at what's happening. Paul tells the Galatians, no, do good to people. Definitely do good. 
But you know what? Charity begins at home, especially to those that belong to the family of believers. You know what I believe was happening in the early church? What was happening was that people were being loved so well inside of the church. Hear me. We were loving each other so well right here that word was getting out. Hey, I thought you didn't have money to pay the rent. Where'd you get money to pay the rent? Oh, my church. Oh, but wait, I, I, thought, I thought your car wasn't working. How, how is it working now? Oh, my church. Um, where is your church? <laughs> I'd like to visit your church. You know what the Bible says? And we're going to get to this. The Bible says that it was God that was adding to their numbers on a daily basis. It was the Lord that was adding to their numbers. Uh, I'm, I'm going to play around here a little bit. Sometimes we think that it is something we need to do. Sometimes we think that, what can I do better? Can I preach better? Can we sing better? Can we, can we do, what can we do better so that we grow? And let me tell you something, the other day, I love it when the Holy Spirit convicts me. I, I love it, I really do love it. I don't like it in the moment, but then I'm like, ah, oh, but it was good. But thank you for that, God. The other day I'm sharing with the board here, and I didn't share this with them because it was just too raw at the time, but I'll share it with you now in public, which makes more sense, right? Um, but, but the other day I'm sharing with the, with the church board here. I said, guys, I don't know how to grow a church. I don't know how to grow a church. I, and I was being very vulnerable. I said, I don't, I don't know how to preach any better than I preach. I don't know how to be a better leader than I am. Like, certainly I've been trying to study this thing and get better at it with time. And, and I'm constantly trying to grow. But I'm, I'm, this is pretty much what you're going to get at the end of the day. Like, this is about as good a preacher as I'm going to be. Maybe I'll improve a little bit, but this is really just me. Unless I try to be somebody else that I'm not, this is me. I said, I don't know how we can do better worship. I don't know how we can do any of those things. But, and I was just being vulnerable. And I, I said, I, I don't know how to grow a church. You know what the Lord spoke to me literally the next morning. I come here, Lord speaks to me. He says to me, you're, you're going to know this from scripture. He says to me, if I don't build my house, the Bible says that if the Lord doesn't build his house, those that work, or that labor, labor in vain. I said, sorry. I was trying to build the house. And sometimes we think we need to build the house. And sometimes we think we need to make this happen. Guess what? The Lord says, he will make it happen. He will build his house. He knows how to build his house. And if he doesn't build it, that's why, that's why prayer is important, by the way. Because if he doesn't build it, then we labor in vain. We labor in vain. In the book of Acts, I want you to read Acts chapter 2. At the very end, it says that the Lord added to their number. That, that God was the one uh, pushing people into the church. And they were growing. They were growing and growing. Who was doing it? Was it them? Was it their preaching? Was it their teaching? Was it their music? Was it their lights? What was it? Was it their seating, their air conditioning? What was it? It was none of those. It was the Lord. But why was it the Lord? Because they devoted themselves. They devoted themselves. They kept being hungry for the word of God. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to one another. They, they wanted to stay in fellowship. I am committed to my brother. I'm committed to my sister. I'm, I'm there. Whatever you need, I'm there. I don't just show up on Sundays. It's, isn't it amazing today how Christians will call themselves Christians when they can't even do the bare minimum? I mean, if you think that, that God should give you a merit badge because you showed up to church on Sunday, then, then, then if that's what we think, we're doing, ladies and gentlemen, we're doing the bare minimum. That's the least that we could do. That's not devotion. 
Devotion is that you're there. The, the, the church in the book of Acts, they were devoted to the word of God, devoted to the fellowship, and they were devoted to prayer. Those people, you could not stop them from praying. And the Bible says, what was the result of it? They saw signs and wonders. They saw miracles. If you're waiting on a pastor, if you're waiting on me, it's not going to happen. If you're waiting on somebody better than me, it's not going to happen. You know what? I believe that God is waiting on us. He's waiting on the church. The church is also a worshiping community, a worshiping community. This is what the word of God says. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and began breaking bread and to, and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. I believe that those signs and wonders would have never happened without the prayers of the people. It was the prayers. It was a church devoted to prayer. They were a worshiping community, praying, praying, seeking the face of God. Uh, worship can involve singing, but it's not just singing. Worship is truly just a, a lifestyle. It's how you live your day in and day out. It's how you honor God uh, everywhere you go. It, it's, that is worship right there. And, and the Bible says that they, again, they continued to meet together. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Uh, they weren't upset about being at church on a Sunday. They weren't upset about coming together. It wasn't like, are we meeting with everyone again? Are they coming over to the house again? I mean, how many times are we going to do this, people? Like, seriously, food is expensive. Can't have people all around. And, and did you see the way those people eat? They broke bread together with glad and sincere hearts. They were happy. The psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I was glad. I was glad. With glad and sincere hearts, they were what? What were they doing? Praising God. Thanking God. I, I believe that the, the natural outcome of it all is going to come when we devote ourselves. And ultimately, um, and this is where it all ties into missions, they were an evangelistic community. Again, the Bible says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. It was God. As they did their part, God did his part. One of the things that uh, Sister Maria reminded me of when we met with the church board, she says, Pastor Robert, I want you to know that when I was talking to them about, uh, you know, I don't know how to do this, guys. Like, I was just being very vulnerable. She says, Pastor Rob, I think you're doing everything. She says, you're teaching us. And she was very honest. And, um, and she said, I don't think it's you. I think it's us. She says, I don't think we're activating like we should. I don't think we're moving like we should. I don't think we're doing what we need to be doing. And you know what? I looked at her and I said, you know what? As much as I don't want to say that you're right, I said, you're right. Because in the book of Acts, if you go back and you read Acts chapter 2, you'll see that it says they devoted themselves. They were committed. They did. They did. It didn't say the apostles did. It didn't say the teachers did. It said they did. When it says the apostles, it's because the apostles were seeing the results of what the church was doing. Again, you should be reminded that unless the Lord builds his house, the builders labor in vain. But there is still labor to do. There is work to be done. It is our responsibility to go into our jobs. It is our responsibility to go back to our families and tell them about Jesus. Will they listen? Will they listen? I don't know. Some might, some may not. 
But I can guarantee you in those moments of crisis, you'll see God use those words that you've shared with them. So finally, here's the last thing I want to share with you. What church should I join? Well, the answer is easy. New Walk Church. Okay, let's close our Bibles. New Walk Church. No, what church should I join? Seriously. The next few points that I'm going to share with you, and there are five points, but they're going to be real quick. The next points I'm going to share with you are going to be uh, coming from the book of 2 Timothy. You see, in the Bible, churches weren't like we are today. Like today, we have a church this block, literally a church next door to us. We have a church a couple of blocks away. Uh, Right within this community, there's at least five or six churches that you could be a part of. And people say, oh, there's not enough churches. Oh, there's enough churches. In the Bible, you didn't have those options. In the Bible, your church was the community that you lived in. You couldn't drive off to another church in a different community. When the Bible talks about the church of Ephesus, it was people that lived in Ephesus. When it talks about the Philippian church, it talks about people that lived in Philippi. So you were automatically a part of the church that you just, that was your community. That's where you lived. And you couldn't just leave. You couldn't just say, I'm leaving this church because, you know, they're not doing things the way I like them to do. I'm going to the other church. No, this was your community. You had to stay there. You had to deal with it. And, and this was your community. So the Bible really doesn't tell us how to pick a church. Like, that's just not in the Bible. If you're looking for that, the best that we can do is we can say, well, who does the Bible tell us to avoid? Because the Bible does tell us certain people and certain communities that we should avoid. Now, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 says this. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And look at the, the next few words. It says, have nothing to do with such people. So although the Bible doesn't tell us what church to go to, it does tell us what communities not to associate with. This list right here. And you're thinking, well, no church has all those people. You haven't been to very many churches. Because there are communities where it's all about themselves. Starts right there, lovers of themselves. I went to an event once, a Christian event, where uh, it was in an arena. So I went with a youth group, and I took our youth group, and our our youth group was sitting in like two rows. And this couple that was on a date to this event, like, who takes you on a date to a Christian event? But it happens. There was a couple that had a date, and would you believe they started fighting us because some of our teenagers had taken their seats? And it was like, and I'm like, this is a Christian event. Like, and why? I don't get it. But obviously, lovers of themselves. People that, you know, just couldn't take the other seats because those were their seats. These are the type of people you should avoid. And if you go to a church, and these are the type of people that you encounter, if you go to a church and, and the messages are very self-centered, they're all about you, and it's never about God, but it's always all about how God just wants to bless you. Those churches, by the way, are packed. Because if people sit down and you're going to tell me how God wants to do for me and for me and for me, I'll be back next week for sure because I want to know what else God has for me. Lovers of themselves. If these are the messages that are being preached, it's all about how God wants to bless you and everything that he wants to give you and all the little treats and all that good stuff, then let me tell you, maybe those are the churches that you should avoid. Then he says, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. 
there's going to be a time. There's going to be a time when people aren't going to want the Bible. It's just the way it is. He said, instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. So if you feel really good about every message that's ever preached at your church, if, if you never feel cut to the heart, like we spoke about earlier, if you're never convicted, but if it always just feels good, you felt like you got close to God and it feels good, you might want to watch out. You might want to be careful with that church. I want to give you an acrostic here. Very simple. Here's my five points. Five things that I believe you should look for in a church. The first one is biblical soundness. I didn't say biblically based churches because a lot of people will take the Bible, open the Bible, read the Bible, and then preach something that's really not in the Bible. They'll just use it as a launching pad. I'm talking about sound doctrine. I'm talking about that, you, that what you hear from the pulpit is exactly what you read in the Bible. I've told you this before. I used to go to a church where, man, the guy would preach up a storm. I would be so excited to hear him preach, and I would be like, oh, my gosh, that is so great. And then I'd go back and read my Bible, and I'm like, huh? This doesn't sound as exciting as what he was preaching. No. Your Bible and your preacher need to sound alike. I'm not here, by the way, to show you things that you can't find in your own Bible. I'm here just to confirm some of what you've already found in your Bible. If I'm not biblically sound, you should leave our church or you should have me leave. But the reality is that you need a church that is biblically sound, good, solid doctrine, things that are going to help you face the storms of your life. Did you notice how many of the prosperity churches that were out there preaching about God's goodness and how much God loves you and how much God wants to give you, how they were MIA during 2020? Did you notice how, how you couldn't find them? Did you notice that all of a sudden they weren't talking about how much God wants to bless you, right? Because all they were doing was giving you all the fluff. They, they were giving you all the good stuff. The other day, we ate at a restaurant uh, that we hadn't been to in a while uh, since we moved back from Florida, and uh, we went there, and holy cow, it was so spicy and so salty, but the place was packed, and we realized, well, it's the salt that keeps people coming back. It's that flavor, and some churches are like that. They keep giving you good flavor, but they never give you the stuff that's really going to help you mature and grow. So the first thing you want to look for is a biblically sound church. The second one is a little weird. You want an imperfect church. And you're like, what? What do you mean I want my church to be imperfect? Here's the deal. Every church is imperfect. I know. I know you're shocked. I'll, I'll let that settle in for a little bit. But every church is imperfect. Reason they... Start with imperfect churches. Oftentimes their leaders are imperfect. I am imperfect. You are imperfect. Imperfect churches. Dr. George Wood, which is the general superintendent, oh, sorry, was the former general superintendent of the Assemblies of God. I heard him while he was speaking once. He said that the, make, the way you make a decision to stay or leave a church, this is, I think is really good. He says the way you make a decision to stay or leave in a church, he says, Consider the 80-20 rule. If the church is primarily 80% good and 20% could use some help, he says stay in that church. Stay in that church. 80%. Why? Because you're never going to find the perfect church. You're going to go to another church and you're going to find that they're imperfect. And if you're looking for the perfect church, you're never going to find it. So 80% good, stay there. Now, if it's 80% bad, 20% good, you may need to go. But 80% good, 20% bad. Find yourself a good, imperfect church. Third one is blessing. Find a church that just won't bless you. 
but a church where you can be a blessing. Find a church where you can be a blessing. There are many, many churches, and I'm going to say this carefully, but in, but in a very loving way. Uh, there are many churches that don't need another one of you. They already have plenty of people like you. There are plenty of churches that don't need another musician. So if you are in a church that needs a musician, stay in that church and be a blessing to that church. There are churches that don't need another usher. They have plenty of ushers. But there are some churches that could use one or two more ushers. There are churches that have phenomenal children's ministries, and they do not need someone else that does children's ministry. Go to a church that, where they can be a blessing to you, but more importantly, you can be a blessing to them. So important, a church that, can, that you can be a blessing. A church that is loving. A church where it's obvious that people love God and people love people. And a place where you yourself can also love others. This is perfect, and it goes hand in hand with the imperfect church. Somebody once told me about another Christian. They weren't a believer, and they told, but they knew the way another Christian was acting, and they knew I was a Christian. And they said, you see, it's because of people like that person that I no longer go to church. And my response to that was simple. I said, well, it's because of people like that that I go to church. Because in church is where I get to love them. In church is where I learn to love them. I know they're a little hard to love, but that's where I go and I practice my loving skills. So find a church that is loving and a church where you can also love people. The last one, a church that's engaging. A church that's engaging. Not only are they engaging in the community, and not only are they engaging in promoting the gospel of Jesus Christ, but also, again, a church where your talents can be used, your ministry giftedness can be used. Where are you needed? Most of us aren't looking for churches on this criteria. Most of us are looking for churches that can be a blessing to me. Again, it becomes about me. A church that speaks what I want to hear. A church that has everything when I walk in. They just grab my kids and I don't know what they do with them. And then they give them to me nicely ironed and ready to go. Knowing the Bible fully by the time I'm done. They hand them over to me. I enjoy a nice message. The pastor never preaches anything that's going to offend me. Everything is cozy and comfortable for me. And that's the way we look for churches. But we never think, how can I be a blessing to this house? What can I bring to this community? So today, I wanted to share those three things with you. I wanted to share those things because I think they matter. What is the church? When did it start? I think it matters so that we know when we're missing it. If if the gospel isn't being preached, we may be missing it. If people aren't being loved, we may be missing it. So it's important to know how it started. It's important to know why it matters. And it's important to know what type of church should I be connected to. Let me tell you something just in closing here. Christ loves the church. 